Hello and good morning. Welcome to Hard Lens Media. Uh, in today's episode, we are going to be talking about the Our Revolution uh, Fair Elections Town Hall meeting, as well as the recent uh, tax cut that was passed by the GOP uh, House. Uh, we'll also be addressing the DAPL uh, oil spill, as well as numerous other stories that are you know that we're currently uh, dealing with. And also, we'll have a special guest for today's show, uh, Troy La Riviere. Uh, we've talked about him before in the past, and he's also been a huge uh, supporter of the Chicago Teachers Union as well as uh, Chicago Public Schools. So let's get this episode going. And I also want to give a very special shout out to our live stream audience that is uh, checking us out on our Facebook page. So if you want to see what we look like in the studio, uh, check it out. But also be sure to be listening to us as well because we always like to have more listeners to hear about us and uh, understand what we're about here at uh, Hard Lens Media and also for people to understand what Q4 Radio is about as well. So uh, let's get things started. Uh, recently, Hard Lens Media was at the Our Revolution Fair Elections Town Hall and uh, we spoke to a lot of interesting guests there uh, from Senator Daniel Biss uh, as well as to uh, uh, Illinois State Representative Carol Ammons as well as uh, Brian Gladstein. And, you know, it was a packed house. There was a lot of people there. And, you know, the one thing everyone was really concerned about was the impact of Citizens United, the McCutcheon decision, and how money in politics is uh, basically crippling and destroying our democratic uh, system that we uh, all seem to cherish and really care about. So, uh, Daniel, uh, what, are you, what were your initial thoughts when you saw that forum, or, well, or at least a debate? Well, I think that uh, everyone that should that should see it should see it on our live stream to really get the full picture. But I thought it was really interesting when uh, Daniel Biss was going on about how you know he spends a lot of time that he didn't used to raising money now to uh, just to compete in the governor's race, whereas um, Pritzker is putting in about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a day, and then he pointed out uh, the gentleman who I didn't really quite uh, understand why uh, uh, until he said it, that uh, the guy sitting next to me was uh, filming on behalf of the Pritzker campaign and it goes to every single one of Biss's events just so that if he says something uh, incorrect that Biss can, not Biss, that Pritzker can use it in a uh, commercial. So he has a guy basically, uh, I would guess, either part-time or full-time, that just follows Daniel Biss around with a camera. So he has. I could think of a million other things, uh, you yeah. know, Pritzker can use better than just having a guy follow Senator Daniel Biss around. It, it you know, it, right off the bat, you know, Chris Kennedy and J.B. Pritzker, you know, they have a, they have a name and they have a lot of backing from a lot of corporate and you know establishment people. And you know we've been trying to get them on our show to you know you know at least get them a chance to really explain who they are, what their campaign's about. We've talked to Teal Hardman, we've talked to Bob Daber, and we've talked to Senator Daniel Biss. And you know the one kind of question I really want to ask them, at least Chris Kennedy and J.B. Pritzker, is their thoughts of money and politics and how it's impacting our democracy and how a lot of people are tired of Democratic and Republican establishment candidates basically saying one thing and then going around supporting the banks, supporting corporations, supporting the top 1%, all the while working class families are struggling all across this country. And in Illinois, I think we all know, uh, you know, we have a long set history of corruption and, you know, uh, politicians running amok. So it's, it, it's, it was really refreshing to see this debate, but also really disheartening to see that you here you have at least one of the Democratic candidates sending one of their people out to film another one of the Democratic candidates who's running for governor just so that he could catch him saying something wrong, which, you know, it, it shows me that at least Senator Daniel Biss is on the right side really addressing Citizens United and how money in politics is crippling our democracy. And then you have J.B. Pritzker having a camera guy go out there and, you know, film and supposedly yeah. try and get something wrong. And by the way, I just want to give a really special shout out because this uh, town hall forum was hosted by Our Revolution Illinois, which is just a chapter of the larger group, Our Revolution, which is a group that's trying to, you know, really address money in politics and have, you know, candidates really run on progressive policy issues so that, you know, something can get done so that it could be real political reform. Yeah, and to the forum, to the town hall itself, I thought it was a very interesting issue of getting people together to talk about money and politics. I think this is, we, you know, we've been to events before where money and politics was discussed, but we haven't been to events where, you know, pol politicians coming together with the distinct purpose of talking about money and politics. 
Right. So it was a very unique event in that sense. And, uh, you know, they had a lot of uh, input from people that were there. Uh, we, I mean, we had a bunch of great interviews with everyone that are in the process of coming out right yeah. now. Two are out already. Uh, but I, th- I think it was good. I mean, the, the room, it almost felt like we were setting up uh, when things were closed and then everything opened up and about, you know, 50 people. It was a small room, but it was it was definitely at capacity. They were standing room only. Well, there were a lot of interesting people there as well, uh, especially you have one, the challenger, uh, who's going up against uh, Alderman Berrios. Uh, you know, as we all know, Berrios is one of the head uh, people in the uh, – he's one of the head aldermanic uh, uh, treasurers in regards to uh, what's happening in, uh, with, you know, uh, real estate developers coming into low-income communities and developing it, gentrification. Uh, Troy Lalavier, uh, one of our guests, was he was there as well, and there were numerous other, um, you know, progressive groups and independent reporters covering this event as well. Because uh, it's it's quite clear that you know a- in the aftermath of the 2016 uh, general election, uh, people are tired of establishment politics and establishment uh, false promises. They're tired of the neoliberalism. They're tired of uh, just struggling day to day. People want real reform and people who are going to actually represent them, be it at the state level or at the federal level. And it's it's going to be a tough uphill climb. And there's groups like uh, Represent Us or Wolfpack that's really trying to get money out of politics. But you know, it's it's a tough fight. And if this is something you care about. You know, uh, check out our revolution. Check out uh, groups that are trying to get money out of politics. Yeah, uh, you know, I I can want to want to speak for Kit, but I think I do speak for him on this that. As far as we're concerned, money in politics is the first and most important um, piece in dealing with the completely dysfunctional U.S. powered structure. I wouldn't even want to say political system, but the power structure itself. Yeah. We're currently oriented as a country, and you know many other countries are very similar, where if you have money, you matter. And if you don't have money, you don't matter anywhere near as much. Yeah. And, you know, with with the way things are going— it's only a matter of time before more people become awoke and more people actually choose to get actively involved in the political process and uh, really step up. And, you know, then we'll find out where our elected officials stand, be they Democrats or Republicans. So uh, whether you're independent, Democrat, Republican voter, um, really just take a step back and look at where your elected officials stand on issues and who's really supporting them and what have they done for you recently? Because if they're not doing their job by representing you or making your community better well we have a democracy elections have come and just vote them out and get somebody who can actually get the job done but now we're going to move on to another issue and something that's it's a herald of things to come uh and this is the well the recent crisis that's happening with retail and um the long-term impact of store closings and uh, the sign of our economy, you know, people, you know, the stock market's going up. But uh, Dan, I think you know we, we've talked about this before in the past in previous episodes. But I think for our viewers and uh, our listeners who are you know checking us out right now, why don't you give us like a, a good idea of what's really happening? So we have a enormous amount of closings of uh, various types of stores, uh, almost uh, in this case uh, chains that are owned by much larger companies. So you have your your, your big box stores, things of that nature. So the issue is that, you know, stores close, stores open all the time. It's all about the balance that is maintained by those openings and closings. And more uh, within from 2017 onwards all the way moving to 2018, uh, things are not looking good for the retail industry. A lot more stores, a lot more stores are closing. And this, I have a graph right in front of me. It shows that basically from 2013 to 2017, they were you know were, they were more or less on par with each other. You know, a thousand would close, a thousand would open, more or less. But now in the last year, it looks like about four thousand more have closed than have opened. Now, why is this happening? Well, you know, some people say, oh, it's the Amazons of the world, and they're getting the millennial audience and what have you. And they say, no, that's that may be a factor, but it's not really the major factor. One major factor that they were talking about in the article by Bloomberg said that it has more to do with Debt that these stores, a lot of it is through buyout, through venture capitalist firms and various mergers, that these stores and businesses, though the the management, the corporate the corporate offices of them at least make the decision, 
And now they're burdened with a lot of debt. And a lot of them are having debt that they're increasingly having trouble paying off because it's risky debt and that means high interest. And because, you know, sales aren't like tumbling or anything, but they're not growing. And this debt always assumes that you're going to have growth to match the debt. And so the case is that just a lot of stores have a lot of debt. And they were saying that in the next few years, let me see if I can find the exact uh, portion of the article where it says that. But in the next few years, they expect, uh, okay, so it looks like about, yeah, it looks like there's all many dates through different companies between 2019 and 2025 where a lot of this debt will hit different interest rates or it will make different, um, have different monetary impacts that they may not be able to uh, compensate. So that's going to be an issue since retail stores are still, even though they're low wage, it's still one of the big providers of jobs in the country. So you're going to have an issue where all these major stores that have put themselves in debt through mergers, acquisitions, etc., are going to all of a sudden start going out of business. That's going to cause people to go out of business. It's going to decrease consumer confidence. That can cause other ripple effects. So we're looking at the start of something that can turn out um, very negatively in the next couple years. You know, um, I I visited a a few small towns here in Illinois as well as going to uh, Indiana and you know, a lot of the communities, you know, their main heart to, to, you know, their main economic heart are these large uh, real estate, uh, not real estate, uh, retail uh, stores, you know, these big box stores, these concrete buildings that, you know, a lot of people, you know, go to work to. And if they go belly up, if they go bankrupt, well, then there's another closed building, uh, lack of jobs, lack of economic opportunity. And, you know, it, it just leaves another scar for a lot of people to deal with. And the thing is, it's, uh, if they go, if they go belly up, um, the ripple effect is that everything else is affected as well. Let correct? me let me read a uh, quote from this. So I'm starting here. Even worse, this will hit as a record one trillion dollars in high yield debt, which basically just high interest for all industries come comes due over the next five years, according to Moody's. The surge in demand for refinancing is also likely to come just as credit markets tighten and become much less accommodating to distressed borrowers. So huge amount of debt's going to come up. Now, usually if you want to refinance, you go somewhere and do that. But at that same time, those refinancing industries are going to be less likely to help even these large corporations out. So yeah, this is an issue going forward. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's it's another crisis that um, many of Americans are going to have to deal with, and some of us can't really recover from. And it's really unfortunate that uh, this is the this is the run amok capitalism that we have. This is the kind of uh, system that uh, really really will only benefit those who are in the top one percent because they'll be okay. Whereas everyone else, no matter who you are, you're at the bottom, and this will hurt you. This will affect you, and it's it's just another sign of things to come and for some reason it's you know it's really throwing me aback the stock market just still keeps on climbing up it's still reaching up to parallel numbers i mean it's 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 rather frightening but moving on to at least to some good well not to some good news uh, i'm that's that's my mistake worse Uh, news yeah more more worse news and that's uh something right next door to us and that's the uh, crisis in east chicago uh indiana uh, just a little refresher, the community in East Chicago, Indiana, we've done some work there in the past. Uh, there was a community there, uh, Calumet, uh, predominantly mostly African-American, Latino, uh, working-class families who are now suffering due to massive amounts of exposures to lead and other toxic materials. And, you know, just for another, you know, I, you know, just for you guys to understand as well, um, Indiana has a big laissez-faire attitude towards the large corporations and industrial corporations that are uh, there in that state. And a lot of these industrial corporations have their plants near to Lake Michigan. And because of lack of regulation, these plants do pour some of their toxins uh, into our drinking water. And look, Indiana isn't in another country. It's right next door to us. And we both share Lake Michigan. So guess what, people of Chicago? What they pour into the lake it's going to come to us. You're not safe. It's the, the Lake Michigan is being contaminated by dangerous material. So to give people an idea of what we're f- actually like what physically exists there. So West Calumet which Kit was talking about oh, itself right. was built on a US lead refinery. So you know a lot of 
really high. It, we, we, we documented this a while back, but they have incredibly high levels of uh, uh, land-based, uh, soil-based lead. Incredibly high, hundreds of times. Oh, well, again, EPA says anything below 200 parts per million is fine. Anything above 400 parts per million needs to be acted on. They have front yards with kids playing in them that have 90,000 parts per million. So that's th- those are some issues that we have. So now, currently what's happening is uh, uh, two different sides. So one we've heard before is the dumping of um, toxic material into Lake Michigan, which, of course, you're, if you're going to Lake Michigan to swim, chances are you are uh, coming in contact with at least a little bit of it. In this case, um, they're facing a lawsuit, U.S. Steel, which, again, it has the largest steel refined uh, blast furnace, I should say, in the Western Hemisphere is located right on Lake Michigan. Yeah, it's, uh, it's in Indiana. Right? It's in Indiana. Yeah. And because of their uh, attitudes, one thing we covered before is the discussion of toxic waste, regulated toxic waste, because in Indiana, if you mix toxic waste with water, it's diluted and therefore okay to put in water. But it's regulated. It's regulated because you mix it with water, so they'll just take Lake Michigan water, mix it, inside their plant and then dump it right back out into Lake Michigan. And in this case, uh, U.S. Steel is uh, being sued because they dumped, how much was it, Um, uh, uh, 56.7 pounds of chromium, another toxic metal, into the lake, which was, and here's the crazy part, I think. I didn't think the, the, the amount that they dumped in is the crazy part. It's that there's an allowable limit. They just exceeded it by 89%. Okay. So if they had only if they had only dumped about twenty five pounds in the water in twenty four hours, that would have been fine. Okay, but they they did fifty six. That's not fine. Oh boy. Yeah. So that's how that is. And then simultaneously, uh, East Chicago, which again, East Chicago West County Met that we covered is within East Chicago, um, is now trying to get a uh, Coke factory, which is. Um, you know, for for burning, uh, for again, the, the, the blast furnace press, you need coke to make sure you get the, uh, the the heat high enough. And they're saying, hey, this thing is this this facility isn't passing inspection. Either fix it so it's within regulation, or shut it down. We're tired of being poisoned. And there, the town is determining whether to shut it down or not. But it's good to notice uh, that while we were in East Chicago. You have to understand, from the perspective of these, uh, the, the the mayorship and the, the executive office legislature, they very much seem oriented as mentally how they see themselves as we are a town of industry with some people, rather than seeing themselves as we are a town of people with a lot of industry. And I want everyone to you know take a step back and really understand really the crisis that we're dealing with. Think about what we use Lake Michigan for, okay? And let's ignore shipping and, you know, recreational fun. You know, we use that water to drink, to shower, to wash our clothes, uh, to, you know, to make sure our crops are, you know, uh, maintained, uh, to feed our livestock. And, you know, we need water to live. I mean, the, the old saying that the, uh, the um, you know, the water protectors were saying during the Dakota Access uh, Pipeline uh, protests, water is life. We need water. And if we contaminate one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the Western Hemisphere and we can't use it because we've been dumping these toxic metals and waste into there, future generations will look at us like we're cowards or that we have, um, you know, uh, that we didn't care at all about the real social and political impact uh, that these materials will, will make in our lives. So, you know, find out where your elected officials stand on this issue because what affects – what's happening in Indiana will affect us here in Illinois. And if you're a listener to us in Indiana or you follow us on our social media, really it, now's the time to get politically involved. And if your elected officials don't care about uh, what these uh, unregulated corporations are doing, well, like I said to our listeners here in Illinois – uh, step up, get politically involved, vote them out, and get people who actually do the job. Because uh, if we don't do something now, we're going to be regretting this for the rest of our lives. And we need water. Water is life. I do want to harken back to remember when we used to have gasoline, and not gasoline in our gasoline, lead in our gasoline. Yeah. And that caused huge amounts of issues for people all over the country and anywhere that had lead in the gasoline. 
it's no different. We're putting toxins in our body in a way that we could choose not to, but we're choosing to because it's more profitable for certain people. But going on what Kit said about Water is Life, I want to jump over to our other story on the Dakota Access Pipeline. I'm sure everyone's heard about the spill that has uh, just happened, which, of course, no one predicted there weren't protests for months or years telling people, hey, we don't want this here because there's going to be a spill. Uh, Dakota Access saying, oh, there's no possible way a spill could ever happen while we have a 205,000-gallon spill that just occurred. Yeah, but, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Yeah, know. but right now, uh, there's a lawsuit that is happening against, I believe it is, Tiger... Tiger Swan. Tiger and Swan. And it wasn't one of the... Merc- yeah. It wasn't a, like a private contractor. So Tiger Swan is a, no. you know, it's a, is a mercenary company that was hired by the oil companies, worked with many would say, illegally so, with the police, because you're not allowed to have a mercenary corporation where it can share information with a public police force, but that's what happened. So you have a lawsuit that is being made against them, and uh, because they were, it looks like, uh, making fake lawsuits about uh, the people that were protesting, and they were uh, suing groups that had nothing to do with uh, Dapple or the fight against Dapple, they were making. Let me see if I can pull up a name uh, of any groups that they were going against. Uh, I don't have any right in front of me right now. They but, did. They did have. Oh, um, like against Greenpeace was one of them. So yeah. basically, they would. The events happened uh, for Dapple, and then so they would go, "Hey, we have some evidence that Greenpeace was directly telling these activists to do things, which you know we now for from evidence they didn't do." Right. Malicious things that didn't occur. And so we're suing uh, com- uh, nonprofits like Greenpeace to, you know, it's very clearly to tamp down so that they won't ever stand against us. Right. And, and I-, I just want to just note that there were a lot of independent media outlets there covering the Dakota Access Pipeline protest. And for the most part, the people who were being assaulted and being hurt uh, were the protesters. The protesters weren't doing anything anything wrong with except standing up for their right to protect their land and their water resources from a corporation that was going to contaminate their land and their water resources. They weren't doing anything wrong. And so to read a quote directly, in August, the law firm founded by Mark Kazowitz, Donald Trump's personal attorney for more than a decade, filed a 187-page racketeering. Racketeering is uh, simply, you're not, it was, it's basically a thing used to get gangsters I mean, that was when it was originally done, so you can get people like Al Capone. Anyway, so they're getting a racketeering complaint against Greenpeace, Earth First, and the divestment group Back a Bank Track in the U.S. District Court of North Dakota seeking $300 million in damages on behalf of Energy Transfer Partners, people that did the pipeline. The No Dapple movement, the suit claims, was driven by, quote, a network of prudent, uh, uh, punitive, not-for-profit, and rogue eco-terrorist groups who employ patterns of criminal activity and campaigns of misinformation to target legitimate companies and industries with fabricated environmental claims, such as, hey, your pipeline is going to leak. We should stop that. Um, so there's, yeah, there's these, all these lawsuits that are happening right now against these groups, which, again, if you're an oil company, you don't have any issue paying for those legal fees. You're rolling in money. You get subsidized by the government. You're yep. making huge bonuses. You are massive uh, establishment money. But then you have Greenpeace, which isn't known for rolling in the dough. No, they have no money. This really. is going to – this lawsuit, you, even if they win, which you know it looks very much like they would, it's still the equivalent of I'll take less than a percentage of my money and I'll take 25% of your money. Yeah, go figure. So um, – it's, it's just another example of these uh, private corporations, these mercenaries that are constantly taking advantage of people, trying to infringe on our rights, and also accusing people for crimes that uh, they did not commit groups and you know social groups and activist groups for crimes that they did not commit. And uh, it's, it's rather sad to see that uh, this is happening in our country. But at and least moving on to some you know good news, at least, and that, that's what I meant for some good news, is that – and this is something that we actually covered uh, a few months ago, and that was – uh, in which uh, convictions were uh, tossed for 15 framed individuals by uh, corrupt police officers here. And uh, Harlan's Media actually did a live stream and also did an HD version. You could check that out on 
our uh, we actually posted the article to this on our Facebook page yeah. this week. So if you scroll, you'll find it. And I linked in the uh, the YouTube link for the full the full HD. Yeah, yeah. And you guys can check that out. But it's it's when you hear the stories, though, it's it's sad. It's uh, terrible what happened to these uh, fifteen men. But you know, the, the really depressing part is that. You know, there's more than just 15 individuals because this just shows really the lack of accountability for the Chicago Police Department. How our you know city government and Cook County really haven't uh, did their job in making sure that somebody's keeping an eye on our police force. Because y- here you have a police, for- you know, at least one officer framing 15 individuals, putting false charges on them, forcing them to ba- you know basically telling them, "Hey, you give me money." Or I'm I'm gonna send you to jail and putting drugs on them and you know people wonder why a lot of uh, low income minority communities do not trust the police. I mean, there's reasons why. I mean, they haven't been lying. I mean, thanks to social media and cell phone cameras and you know other recording devices, we were actually able to finally see uh, at long last that yeah, there's a lack of accountability and a huge amount of corruption in our police forces and we need the police to make sure that we're, we're safe and protected but we don't want our cops basically forcing innocent people to go to jail for crimes that they did not commit and thank goodness that there was a law firm that was you know willing to help out these individuals and get their lives back to some degree i mean because the impact on them is, is a long-lasting scar so daniel why don't you just kind of give us a little summary of what's happening so basically uh you have this uh, officer who, like it said, basically, as, as it was explained from people talking, again, if you look at our live stream, this, it can do, they give it much more justice than I ever could because they lived it. Yeah. Um, cop would come up and say, it would mainly be people that are on probation, people that had no, that if they were legally challenged, they would be completely ruined. Yeah. And he would be like, hey, give me $10,000. I don't have $10,000. Well, I'm going to come back in about a week. If you don't have $10,000, you're going to get arrested for a crack possession. And who's going to believe you? And so it was an extortion racket. You pay me money or I put you in jail. You pay me money. I and actually during the live stream, someone even commented, yeah, that officer stole 17000 or $7,000 uh, dollars from my cousin. No, from his nephew. From his nephew. Yeah. So, you know, like Kit said, if if you live in a community like that and this is how – these are the stories that you hear. This is the reality of how police are that, hey, maybe that's – that guy over there is a decent cop. I'm sure they know which cops are which since they're always dealing with them. That guy is okay. But then you see this one guy and you're like, oh, no, that's the guy that frames everyone for drugs, that frames yeah. everyone – plants your evidence on them and then you go to people that are in you know wealthier suburban areas i've dealt with people like that a lot and they're like police aren't like that police are good they've never had an experience like that yeah they haven't had had experience you know you know why that is no never you know why that is because when you're a cop and you plant drugs on a lawyer that doesn't turn out well but when you're a cop and you have someone that's on parole that you plant drugs on no one thinks a second thought and when the guy says the cop plant drugs on me everyone's like ah that's really funny you're going to jail and there's been a lot of comedy skits on it uh before in the past and you know now now it's been now because of social media uh, it's becoming more of a reality, and it's not funny anymore. It's not hilarious anymore. It's criminal what's happening, and thankfully there's some justice that's happening. But you know, again, we have a real lack of accountability, and you know, we need our political figures, be it at the city level, county level, state level, and federal level, to really get involved and hold our police forces accountable because there are good cops. But sadly, there is a system that basically silences them to where either they choose not to get involved, they quit the police force, or they themselves become corrupted because there's no one holding accountability over the system. And here you have 15 men that have finally been exonerated. But I want everyone to realize that there's just more than 15. The Actually, number is much higher. On, in this case, so again, I want to throw out the guy's name. It's Sergeant Ronald Watts. All he, right. He was a sergeant, and it was not just him. It was this group of people underneath him as okay. well. Right. But as, as – as, I'll read it uh, directly. Where did it say? Their arrest – this is the group of them 
Their arrests led to at least 500 convictions. So far, 26 convictions, which is more than what we're talking about, have been overturned. That leaves 474 not accounted for. Yeah. So think of it. So how many people does a cop arrest a year? If there's one corrupt cop or a group of a small group of corrupt cops, like even if that's all there is and there's nothing more, you still you're talking 500 convictions and over a thousand arrests. Well, we you know what we need to do. Uh, basically, if this is something that upsets you, um, call your local officials, uh, and especially if you have people that were affected by you know Sergeant Watson, his um, you know posse of uh, officers that were helping him out do these terrible crimes. Uh, call up your local elected officials and ask what's happening to the other, what, 500, 400 plus individuals yeah. that are, you know, in jail for probably crimes I think that they that did not commit. I, I mean, I, we got to get think, them out. I think in this case, um, I believe this would be Kim Fox, who would be, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how you would reach her directly. I'm sure you can call her office, but yeah. she's the one that initiated these, um, uh, 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 retiring these convictions of these people. So. Who knows? This could be the start of many people being pushed, but I think it's good. Like Kit said, we got to get them out if they're in jail for a crime that they did not commit. Yeah. If they were wrongly and show and show and show, I yeah. think, but for for the, po- for the point of calling aldermen and such, show them that there's a public support for this because yeah. a lot of uh, uh, aldermen, just politicians in general, always have the sense that hey, it's really unpopular to release people from jail. Yeah. Show them that there's support. Yeah, and uh, you know what's really uh, bad? Having an innocent man or woman in jail for a crime they didn't commit. I think we want to see bad guys in jail, not innocent people being framed. So we got to get those people out. Um, It's just how it is. There's a corrupt system, and uh, you listening, you have a social responsibility to get involved and, you know, step up. Don't be that person who wishes they could have helped. But Moving on to another story, and this is a segment that me and Daniel are going to be talking about for the next half hour. It's uh, going to affect all of us, and that was the wonderful, happy-go-lucky tax cut that the United States House passed in a 227 uh, to 205 uh, vote. The House of Representatives approved a tax cut that's basically going to benefit the top 1%. Uh, The House Tax Cuts and Job Act would cost 1.43% trillion in deficit spending over the next guest, uh, decade, uh, with most of that spending going to businesses. Now, uh, pretty much this is going to affect uh, a lot of people. Uh, you know, And of course, the, the, the Tax Policy Center is projecting that the middle class will get an $830 uh, tax cut next year under the bill compared to the $3,700 uh, tax cut for the top 1%. So the top 1% are doing pretty Pretty good. I mean, I wish I was a billionaire, but I, I, that's never going to happen. So here's the key with this. So the way that this bill is being passed, I forget the exact rule that they're following, but it states that if it's under $1.5 trillion, which, again, this is just under $1.5 by the budget office, uh, then you don't need to have bipartisan support on this. You can basically pass it with a uh, majority vote, which is the path that they're doing. So they have a lot of stuff crammed in there so that it doesn't pass – that 1.5 trillion now there's something else i need all of you to uh realize now of course we're a long way from 2027 but by 2027 after a temporary 300 dollar per adult temporary cre- uh, uh, credit expires the middle class tax cut will drop to 360 dollars per year that's fantastic i guess and as the benefits for the top one percent grow to 62,300 per year so again Top 1%, you guys are doing great. So even the way he read it, if you listen, it's saying after a decade, it's going to shift it so that it's more than 1.5 per, which would be, really, if we're, we're saying 1.5 trillion, we're really saying $150 billion a year. And so what they're saying in that, because they need to do it within a decade, is that after a decade, they're going to flip it so that it goes beyond $150 billion a year. And here's the thing to remember. So when you give the tax cuts... Tax cuts aren't – they don't just appear out of nowhere. They have to come from something else. So if you look at what this is coming from, there's going to be tax increases for certain people in the middle class. There's going to be a large amount of people cut off of Medicare. Mm-hmm. So, th- again, the money comes from somewhere. You can't just cut and not take it from somewhere else. So they're taking from the middle class and redistributing it to the – a very small group of people on top. One of the big things that's happening here 
is the estate tax is being cut. Mm-hmm. And this is important because I don't own $5.5 million in assets personally, but to those that do, the in- purpose of an estate tax is so you don't have a landed entry. You don't have an a, 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 a class of aristocracy that forms from generation to generation. So if you have a billion dollars— I thought we had a revolution to get away from aristocracy and monarchs. We thought so. Okay. But, right. So if you have if I have a billion dollars and I want to donate and I want to uh, give that to my children, you can't just have a kid that grows up having a billion dollars and then have their kid have it because you can't— If you have that much money, it's almost impossible— you can't spend all that. I mean, you, you can't can try. spend it. You, you can try. It's hard to lose that money. See, you know. So you have a you have a, a a tax on that. So when you pass something like you know a portion, a large portion of that money goes to the government, and that actually pays a large amount of taxes. It's a very important tax, and that's being done away with. Trump is going to benefit greatly. You have the Cokes are going to benefit to the turn of thirty billion dollars, which again, if you take the money and you give it to them thirty billion, it has to come from somewhere else, or it has to come from taking away benefits that were given to people. And guess what benefits get taken away? It's not subsidies for corporations, it's health care for people that can't afford it. Education. Education. Oh, don't forget the social infrastructure as well. So basically what's uh happening is, you know, thirty percent of the middle class is going to be paying more taxes in twenty 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 seven under the bill, and it's important to note that there were all, all the Democrats and at least 13 Republicans voted against this bill on Thursday. So uh, with the bill out of the House, it's going to go to the Senate, and the House and Senate bills are largely uh, similar. And for the record, currently we have a GOP House and Senate. It's very conservative, pro-Republican, and pro-tax cut. So um, there's probably going to be a last minute uh, amendment to the senate bill that will probably repeal obama's cares or the affordable care Act's individual mandate and it will lead to a whopping 13 million fewer people with health care insurance and we've mentioned this before about homelessness and people living in poverty it takes one bad day one bad day for you to get an injury or to be afflicted by some sort of disease or cancer or anything like that to where you cannot pay the hospital to take care of you, you can't have a doctor look at your ailment. You can't buy the appropriate medicine so that you know you can live or, or you know have the pain not affect you. So it's 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 like you know we have an entire system of elected officials who are bought and sold by the large corporations who don't really care what the average person is going to go through. But if this passes in the Senate, a lot of people are going to get hurt, and it's wrong. It's unjust and. You know, you would think the, the Republican Party, at least, you know, their their stance is, hey, they're pro family values. They're, you know, they're they're pro America. They want everyone to be okay and be strong. If you do this, if you guys let this be officially passed, and Donald Trump approves it as well, uh, a lot of your constituents are going to get hurt. They might not realize it, but they're going to get hurt by this. This affects everyone. And the big part about this is, is the individual mandate. The reason the mandate was so important was. It took people that, you know, were myself and kids age, young, healthy type people, and it puts them in the market. The reason that's important is because insurance is a pool. Uh, you need to balance out the people that are sick, and you have to balance that with people that are healthy. Sick people take a lot of the services. Healthy people don't. If you take away all the healthy people, then you get this group that costs a huge amount of money. And then everyone's premiums are going to go up. If they're subsidized under certain plans that have been past in, um, in uh, uh, blue states, mainly blue states, those people are going to be at the moment uh, kind of unaffected. But for everyone else that doesn't get those uh, subsidies, which is a huge amount of people, either because they make too much or they don't apply for them, uh, you're talking premiums just going up by 50% just like all the time. I mean, already, uh, I mean, this taking away that pool mm-hmm. will effectively lead to an ever-increasing death spiral that will kill the entire bill because it will become too expensive to be a part of because everyone that's healthy will just leave because it becomes too expensive. Because if you're healthy, you're not taking anything from health care. You don't have a penalty. You don't have any requirement to do so. But you're paying $500 a year or, I don't know, you know, a lot of money. I mean, a lot of $1,000, whatever it may be, you're not using it. You're going to say, I'm not going to take this insurance. 
why would I need this? And then because of that, everyone else is that is stuck in there because they do have sick, they aren't have they do have cancer, they do have diabetes, and they need that medicine. They don't have a choice to leave because if they leave, they die because medicine is keeping them alive, and their prices will just keep going up until it's almost as if they're paying the raw cost. Yeah, and uh, this is what happens when you have a system of uh, money and politics, corrupt officials. And I also want everyone to understand that the centerpiece of this Republican bill is a massive reduction of uh, taxes on businesses and their owners. And the bill basically drops the corporate tax rate from 35% to 20%. And it's going to cut the top rate of those businesses whose profits are taxed at individual income from 39.6% uh, to 25%. And the bill condenses all individual income taxes into four brackets of 12%, 25%, 35%, and 39 and only households that make more than $1 million up from 470000 today would pay the top rate. So, so I mean, not, o- yeah. not only is – so if you're a corporation, already major corporations that exist today pay, you know, 0 to 5 percent effective taxes under a 35 percent rate. So guess what they're going to pay if you drop it to 20 with deductions? And then in addition, that the, this is the really sneaky part – Deductions for businesses and corporations, they're keeping those. Those are fantastic. Keep them awesome. Let them do their thing. But those same deductions, if you're an individual, are gone. Mm -hmm. So if you're a corporation, uh, if you're, what was it? If you're an individual and you have a home and you have to pay taxes on it, you used to be able to deduct those taxes. Not anymore. Those taxes are now undeductible. On a federal uh, from uh, from um, federal taxes, but if you do the exact same thing in your corporation, perfectly fine, completely legal to do. If you're a corporation, well, corporations are people, Daniel. Well, exactly. So if you are a corporation and you outsource all your jobs to some country in Asia, probably China, somewhere else, yeah, they can you can deduct your taxes from that. If again you're one of those workers that got laid off, sorry, you're not going to be able to deduct your household. Uh, so, again, they had to keep the deficit below $1.5 trillion over 10 years, and this is how they're doing it. Yeah, and uh, you know, going back to the estate tax that Daniel was talking about, uh, basically it's, uh, the estate tax uh, impacts only the wealthiest 0.2% of Americans. So that's a very large population. I'm being sarcastic, people. Um, because uh, the share of inheritance below $11 million for uh, couples is exempted, this Republican bill would uh, immediately double that threshold, and by 2024, the estate tax would be entirely repealed. Getting rid of the estate tax would be basically a gift to anyone who's super rich or you know has been in businesses for years. So let's take Trump, for example, and his family. Uh, it's going to benefit him and his heirs and their heirs. And let me just tell you something. Just as a former United States Marine veteran, I don't want to fight for an aristocracy. I don't want to fight for a monarchy. I don't want to protect an empire. I want to fight for a republic. Why would I want to fight for some rich man and his children, children, and his other children, children who will never, ever, ever, you know, d- step up and 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 fight or or like you know get involved? They'll they'll never do that. And so that's a system that we're getting to. We are getting towards an aristocracy system to where the rich top one percent uh, are going to benefit from what their ancestor did, while the rest of us are going to be living in abject poverty. We won't have health care. We won't have education. We won't have working infrastructure. We'll be having menial jobs. And the American dream uh, will be dead. And I think it's good to... I would disagree that we'd be moving to an aristocracy. I think we just it makes more sense. We're moving back to feudalism. Oh, well... Yeah, yeah. I, mean, it's, I, mean, I mean, what is capitalism? I mean, Wealth of Nations was at the very... during the enlight, quote-unquote Enlightenment age. Yeah. I mean... Capitalism is just a reformed way of looking at how feudalism works. You have a very, very, very small amount of people that have actual power. You have a, a slightly larger group underneath them that manages that wealth. Everyone else, else is a serf. Yeah, and you know the thing is, like, people aren't going to take that. that. That's the thing. I want the, 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 the elected officials to understand what you're doing. People are going to get involved. They're going to wake up, and they're going to push back. And well, the thing is, they have they, they they need to make the, the decision for themselves is 
uh, do we do we really want to go down this road? So basically, everything hinges on the Senate and whether the Senate will pass this or not. Well, again, going to the state text when he mentioned uh, the dates, same thing. Slowly put it in so it ha- really takes kicks in over at, after ten years. So, yeah. but again, the the big pr- uh, point of this is from a U.S.'s point of view, the U.S. had the strongest. You know, we're being overtaken by China as we speak every second. The U.S. had a strong, the strongest economy because it had a booming middle class, and each person was because of education, because they had the ability to work and not uh, have the uh, same kind of health issues. I mean, it's kind of we've always had a health care problem, but it's not been as big as it has been in the last couple decades. So think of all the things that you need to make someone a high productive, uh, highly productive citizen. You need education. You need job availability. You need them to be able to be productive. And you, if you look at Americans and their individual ability to how much they can produce, mm-hmm. it's still uh, exceedingly high uh, per capita. That's the real value of what makes America strong and the country strong. And we saw that style not you know, it didn't apply to everyone. But in the 60s, that style and the people it applied to worked really well. That idea of you could have one person have a job well, and, and that would be and that would be everything they needed for their family. Right. And, and that made the economy work. Everyone could buy things. Our economy is built on consumerism. And then we said through a Reagan style trickle down economics that, no, that doesn't work, even though it's the thing that worked. Companies having large amounts of money and individuals having large amounts of money will trickle down through the system uh, there, to work. It, it's trickling down, but yeah, not in the is. way of, uh, you know, of, of wealth distribution. Like the, well, there are, they're, it's they're, trickling they're basic, down the way basic, the urinary system trickles down. Yeah, yeah they're, they're urinating on us, and uh, it's, it's, it's funny to them, but it's painful for us because the thing is so but, many of us are going to be, uh, be suffering. Yeah, well, that, that's the, great point I'm trying, the greater point I'm trying to make is that this path doesn't even help the people that are getting money. Yep. This it takes away the value of America to make Americans poor is what makes America poor. Because if you make them poor, if you make people poor, they can't focus on being productive. They're too focused on I can't hire a babysitter, so I got to do X, Y, or Z, or I can't do this. It's survival or, mode mentality, and they don't have yes. time to think about buying into the economy or buying goods or anything else like and that. And how can you be productive yeah. if you're in that mode? Yeah, if you're in that mode and you have to worry about health care, worry about anything, just remember that, guys. If, if the vast majority of population is poor and broke, they're only going to be thinking about themselves. They're only going to be looking out for themselves, and they're not going to care about the United States or any issues or what makes America great. They're they only have a hierarchy look- of needs, yeah. and yeah. the hierarchy of needs is you, that call, there's a certain amount of money you need to maintain those needs. And here, the United States, the richest, most powerful country in the world, cannot take care of its people. And once again, our elected officials in the United States House and Senate are only going to be looking after for their donors and everything else. And sooner or later, they're going to look outside the window and realize that the American people are going to be out there in mass yelling at them because we're going to remember who voted for this. We're going to remember who were the big proponents of it and supporters of it. And if you guys think that you're safe, get out of here with that because we're going to remember. So if you want to push the American people into poverty, if you want to push them into you know being serfs, be prepared for a pushback and – you know, just dealing with the Senate because you know this bill is going to go into the Senate. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, just dealing with what's going to happen in the twenty in twenty twenty seven, uh, the corporate tax cuts, households basically earning between seventy five thousand to a hundred thousand will see on average no tax cut, and households earning less than seventy five thousand dollars per year will see an average of an increase. Yeah. That's an increase. And that's, remember, it's a tax increase, but it's not. It's also services that had money being sent to you. Remember, if you don't have a redistribution of funds, you get feudalism. Yeah, and buying you. That's what feudalism was, was yeah. huge amounts of wealth held by certain people and everything went up. It didn't recycle downwards. Right. You have a regulated capitalist economy where you could have a union job and that was protected by law or you can work for the government in a guaranteed job. You can do all these things. Those are the things that make a middle class economy exist. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I just want everyone to to remember that currently right now, and this number is probably going to go down lower, 
uh, the medium household income in the United States is fifty five thousand dollars. That's fifty five thousand dollars. And so with this uh, Republican tax bill that's being passed and we got to own up to it. Look, I'm not saying the Democrats are saint either, uh, but, you know, this is a Republican bill that's being supported in the House and Senate, uh, mostly by the GOP. Uh, you know, if you're earning seventy five thousand to one hundred thousand, you're safe. You're OK. But the vast majority of the United States population is making fifty five thousand dollars a year. So we're going to see a tax increase. That's one more thing they got to worry about. That's one more issue they have to think about. So, uh, you know, how, how does this make you feel? How does it make anyone feel? It's going to make them really lose trust into the two-party system, and hopefully this doesn't pass the Senate. It, it, it really must not pass the Senate. Yeah, t- Trump will definitely sign if it does. And uh, But, you know, to the history of the Trump administration, this will probably get trumped up at some point, and something will happen and it won't pass. Yeah, you can I mean, hope, but that, I mean, that's I mean, just that's, again, that's, that's just that's, going that's, with what's historical data. But yeah. who knows? Yeah, this might be the one thing that he successfully gets done, and that's screwing over the American taxpayer and basically future generations to come. And look, uh, I understand that a lot of Trump supporters voted him in because they wanted to see a change to the system, but you know, a lot of them were working class people as well, and this is going to affect them too. And Look, Trump is a rich man's son. He comes from a rich background. He doesn't care about anyone, whether you support him and you're from a working class background, whether you're against him and you're from a working class background, whether you're independent, Democrat, Republican, vote. Look, the only people Trump cares about is himself, the people who uh, kiss his feet, and his family. And that is it. And same thing for some of these GOP lawmakers who are supporting this bill. I mean, it's wrong. It's unjust. And actually, I remember a, a thing I heard from uh, Mark Cuban when he was talking about how he offered, he, he said to Trump, hey, like sometime like when he was deciding to run, he was like, hey, we should go out and have dinner with regular families. And Trump was like disgusted at even the notion of having dinner with regular families. What? Eat with the peasants? Yeah. How dare you speak to me like that? That's offensive. I'm offended. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it seems like how it went. Well, you know, it, it, it goes to show you again, really, just how much power we've given to the rich, the top 1%, the corporations, Wall Street. I mean, we look at these guys in suits and ties who now can buy our elected officials with so much respect and awe, but they don't look at us the same way. We're just in the way we're just menial creatures that basically are supposed to worship the ground that they walk on and so these great geniuses in wall street the same people the same banks uh, you know ceos of these large banks who let the economy crash in 2008 still got away with it they're still protected by our elected officials and mind you democrats and republicans they're both bought and sold by wall street the corporations the top one percent so you know, I will give kudos to the Democrats in the House for not voting for this bill, as well as the 13 Republicans who voted against it as well. I mean, hey, thank you for doing that. But to the other lawmakers in the House that passed it, how dare you do this to us? And to the Senate, please do the right thing and don't vote for this because so many lives will be affected. And I, I, I hope that Daniel's correct and that, you know, Trump's record of failure continues on because if he can go down as a president that never got a single bill passed or never got anything done – so be it. I can live with that. But if this gets passed and he approves it, and he will, uh, our livelihoods will be forever changed. Yeah, this is a uh, – remember – hey, Kit, you remember when Obama was in office and Republicans were like, hey, we can't be spending any money. We have debt. Yeah. And now they're like, hey, we got debt. I don't care. Let's spend money. Oh, no. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hypocrisy. Well, I mean, on the, on the one hand, look, I have my criticism of the Obama administration, yeah. okay? Um, but – I, I will uh, give him this. I mean, at least he was doing the best he could in a system that's clearly corrupt. And the law, GOP lawmakers, I mean, they, they were saying that just because, just because he won. And there was, yes, a lot of you know racism towards the fact that we had an African-American man in the White House. Uh, they didn't like the fact that he was a Democrat. They didn't like the fact that you know he won overwhelmingly in a lot of their key districts as well. But, you know, now that they're in power— you guys don't care about that. You don't care about the impact that this bill is going to do. To hey, Democrats, when people. we aren't in power, we rarely care about making sure the filibuster is a thing that, yeah. is a, that is a thing. Hey, now that we're in power, we don't want to use the filibuster. Yeah. Hey, Democrats, we don't want to do any spending bills because we care about the debt and the national debt's important. Now that we're in power, ah, just do spending cuts all the time. Spend, spend, spend. Spend, spend, spend. Do all the money. Spend all the money you want. Cut taxes. 
hey, Democrats, you're doing all these executive orders that we're not happy with you with now that we're in office. Hey, I love these executive orders. You know, I have my own issues with the Democratic Party. I think that they're just a patronage party yeah. in their leadership. They have the good, they have some good numbers, but they're just a patronage party that is more or less paid to lose. Yeah. But they're the, they're the Washington generals and the GOP are the Harlem Globetrotters. That's a horrible analogy. Yeah, no, know. I'm, I'm going to think of something yeah. a little more timely. But then you have the Republicans who, to their credit, they have a much smaller base – they have a much less popular message. Their policies are incredibly unpopular, and they're still managing to win. And the reason why they're winning is because you have weak backbone uh, Democrats yeah. who are not willing to change or adapt. Yeah. It's the effects of neoliberalism. It and, goes to what I've been yeah. saying. Republicans don't win. Democrats just like to lose. Yeah, and they got to change that mentality. Now, of course, there was that election last week that kind of gives signs of what could happen in 2018, but— Look, I've said this before, and I don't want to be a bear of bad news, but midterms have always been a low voter turnout. So now's the time to really get involved. And if you want to change at least the United States House and Senate, as well as some of your governorships, as well as some of your state legislators, uh, now's the time to really look at who's running for office, what their policies are about, and now's the time to get politically active involved because – the way our democracy works, it's you sitting at home right now. You need to step up and stand up. Me and Daniel both managed to help get Senate Joint Resolution 42 passed here in Illinois, basically making Illinois third state to call for an Article 5 convention to propose a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics. So if me and Daniel can do that, as well as a group of other people, because we, we, were, we didn't do this alone. It wasn't that many of us yeah, either. And, and it wasn't that many of us, and we got it passed in one year. Yeah, and it, Illinois, we were told, was going to be the most difficult state to do it, and we did it. So step step up. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me, who are a lot more uh, politically active and involved than me. Now's the time. Now's the time for you to use your voice. So Democrats, Republicans, independents, step up, stand up together, yeah. because what's going to happen if this passes in the Senate, you're going to get a gut punch, and you're not going to get up from it. Yeah, and politics, you really have to look at it more like a business mentality. You have to say to yourself, this isn't something that I'm doing today. This isn't something that I'm doing just to get to next week. This isn't something. This is something that's almost a lifelong continual process. You can, you know, you can phase in and out of when you please, but like Kit said, this took us a year to get a constitutional amendment in Illinois passed. Yeah. We, we worked hard, and we did it, and politics is the same way. You have... People on one side who were fighting that are paid to do it. They have the experience. They have the political backing. They have money. How do you counter that? A lot of passionate people and time. That's the answer. That's always the answer. So right now, I said on previous um, previous, uh, shows that if you vote in in a primary, generally your vote counts three times as much because only a third of people vote in primaries. So if... Take first thing. So you have three people that vote. Let's say, hypothetically, you spend this next year. You find candidate X that you really like. You like their policy. You think they're going against someone that you don't like. Um, if you get 100 people that don't vote in a midterm election to vote, mm-hmm. that's a statistical change. Exactly. And if you do it over a year, that's just one person every three days. Again, if you if you need to get enough of people, if you get ten people just like you, that's three thousand votes. And if you get another ten times that, three hundred people just like you to do that every year, that's an election win. Yeah, that's that's that right there alone is maybe enough votes to win a primary just on its own. Yeah, and it's not a lot that. of people. That's not a lot of getting people every day. Right, it's just doing it over time and being passionate. Exactly, and Daniel, you're gonna have the final word on that, and so. Uh, We are going to go into our break, and we'll be entering the second hour very soon. So listen, if you're listening to Hard Lens Media and you like independent media, we have a Patreon page. Any uh, donation or support that you guys do really helps us produce more content, produces more interviews, allows us to be on location more. We want to really thank all of you for being involved, so stay tuned. Enjoy the break. We'll be back in the second hour with another 30 segment as well as our special guests. So peace. All right, and we are back. Thank you for tuning in to Hardlands Media. Uh, We are now in the second hour of our episode. So uh, we're going to be talking about an issue that's uh, really affecting... 
looks like uh, we uh, yeah it looks like uh, you know we're going to be dealing with a, a little technical error Daniel uh, why don't you introduce over. why don't you introduce the topic uh, first. basically we will be uh, talking about the Dakota access pipeline and uh, really uh, what's happening with the spill that's happening in that area okay so while kids taking care of it we have our guest coming in uh, Basically, as everyone I mentioned earlier in the show, we have the uh, Code Access Pipeline, which everyone, uh, you know, we covered it for a long time, uh, that everyone said it would spill. Uh, you had the uh, uh, native protesters, the Dakota. Um, I mean, I, I'm trying to introduce a story in a way, but it really comes down to this is exactly what everyone expected to happen. If you have a large oil pipeline that you put through a large area of land in a system that is not foolproof, that can move highly pressurized oil over great distances, you're going to have spills. That's just a natural byproduct of what it means to have an oil pipeline. So you have this whole event that happened in Standing Rock when they wanted to reroute the pipe from Bismarck to through Standing Rock, and the big complaint was hey we need this oil we need this excuse me we need this water to live water is life that was the cry that's what uh, brought people throughout the entire world to uh the dakotas to fight the oil companies and the oil companies as a response would say no it's not going to spill it can't spill we're going to make sure it's new technology it's fantastic it's terrific nothing's going to happen what happened it's not even completed at 100, 210, or 205 gallons, 1,000 gallons of oil has spilled. What, I mean, in a lot of ways, what did anyone expect? It's, it's not finished. In fact, one interesting aspect of this is in Nebraska, it is uh, a few days away from doing final permit approval for the pipeline. So if there was ever a timely moment where governments would say yeah we we don't want spills to happen and we're going to act on it this would be the time but that's not the case this is a you know we'll see what nebraska does if they're going to approve i would say everything we've seen so far with how what the code access does what they what the uh, governments have ignored again we covered earlier when uh, they didn't mind that their police departments were working illegally with mercenary companies but maybe maybe this spill happening right before this final leg of the permitting process will do something. And we've already know from previous reporting on this, that the pipeline itself isn't even worth as much as it was when it was initially laid. And it's it, everything about this is just a shame that it has to be this way in this country, that you can have people on the ground, not able to control their own, own land for the purposes of, Large companies that, again, they say that the oil is coming to us. It's not. It's meant to go to China. Yeah. This is Chinese uh, oil that comes from tar sands from Canada that are being transported through the U.S. And the U.S. is the one suffering uh, a portion of this in the environmental devastation of the process. And the government seems to love it. You know, I want everyone to understand that when we're talking about, um, you know, this, this spill that's going to be affect you know, that, that happened – you know, all these pipelines have a long history of basically uh, failing or being built on the lowest dollar because at the end of the day, their main purpose is to take all that oil, all those tar sands, whatever type of fossil fuel it is, to their location as fast and as cheaply as possible, and they're going to be built cheap. That's the main thing. They're, they're not thinking about public safety or you know underground water reserves or what kind of impact it's going to do on the soil or the surrounding environment. What, what these pipelines do is they just, you know, get the oil there from point A to point B. All the while, the corporations that own these pipelines are basically going to buy off our elected officials who, in turn, are going to turn a blind eye to any type of environmental disaster there is. Look, uh, let's look at our current presidential administration. Uh, Donald Trump's uh, secretary of state, Rex Tillerson, he is a big oil and, C, uh, you know, fossil fuel CEO. And he, you know, his main idea is just to go on the ground take out all the fossil fuels, build as many pipelines as possible, and earn a profit. That's what he did before Trump, and that's probably what he's going to do after the Trump administration because these guys, all what they care about is, you know, getting the maximum amount of profit. And this oil spill, which, mind you, people were saying was going to happen, it, it happened. So, 
here, here's, here's my step back from this. Uh, why do we invest in these pipelines? Why do we? Uh, why are there people, you know, who who are such proponents for these pipelines? They assume that these jobs, these numerous amount of jobs, are going to be created. But do you, you know, everyone needs to remember that at the end of the day, when the pipeline was, uh, the, especially the Dakota Access Pipeline, was going to be built, the amount of jobs that we permit would be thirteen, right? Or was that, or was it a little bit? No, a little low. It's forty. Oh, 40? yeah, no, forty. Oh, that changes the picture completely. Forty oh. jobs. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, never mind. All right, I and stand, a lot, and a lot of those are like security and maintenance. Security and oh, well, you you said maintenance. Yeah. Well, gee, well, it seems like the maintenance people weren't doing their job. Now that what, uh, two hundred and ten thousand gallons of oil spilled, uh, and you know another thing with the Dakota Access Pipeline is that it does connect to Illinois, Patoka, Illinois. Actually, it, it comes into the, uh, our state, so. Uh, that concerns me because there's a lot of underground uh, water reservations here in our state. Uh, our state has a lot of rivers and creeks. I mean, we share the Mississippi River with a lot of states as well. And it's, it's coming into our own backyard. I, I don't like that at all. And yeah. I don't like the fact that since there, if, if a spill can happen in South Dakota, don't sit there and tell me that it can't happen in Illinois. Yeah, and we, you know, through work on hardlands and work with other companies mm-hmm. and this this isn't something that you know isn't this isn't new to us we've talked to people like dallas goldtooth before we've covered protests on exactly this subject yeah. the only people that didn't predict this were basically people in government yeah and even then it's questionable you had Environmental groups saying this was going to happen. You had people living there that said it was going to happen. Well, you did have you, some, had, you did have some elected officials like Tulsi Gabbard, Bernie Sanders, and then presidential candidate Dr. Jill Stein and John Baraka say that this was. But going they to happen. they don't they don't represent those areas. Yeah, that's true. Um, so it seems like yet again it's another situation where the only people caught by surprise are the people that are supposed to be experts, or at least in public official case listen to experts Mm -hmm. but it seems that more and more every day that they just listen to their pockets Mm -hmm. and if you have a person in office who thinks like that they should not be in office find someone to replace them or replace them yourself you know uh, just another example too you know we were talking about the keystone pipeline as well and you know that area has also had some incidents of uh, spills as well. I mean, it, it happened there too. And, you know, you had activists saying the same thing. This thing is going to fail. It's not going to hold all this amount of toxic, you know, toxic material. And let's face it, once that oil gets spilled, it's going to leave a lasting impact on the land. I mean, Daniel, we, we, we've talked about numerous times about the dangers of hazardous materials, and you are like a lead contractor. You can understand uh, these metals and the damage that they could do not only to the human body but to the surrounding environment. I mean, when you're working with that kind of material, you've got to be safe. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is, you know, it's it, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, in a sense, I'm cynical in this way that uh, throughout all of history, it's always been when progress of some form is demanded, s- certain things are always ignored. You know, just just so everyone has like a, a certain number of what's happening since the year 2000, uh, pipelines like Keystone, Dakota Access, uh, they've all had 200 significant leaks since the year 2000. And so, remember, the, and so, a so huge caveat a, yeah. to this is that they're usually only self-reported. Yeah. So there's many more that are like, oh, we only spilled a few hundred gallons mm-hmm. or we just don't want to talk about it or, hey, we cleaned it up really quick, so we're not going to mention it. So factor those in. Exactly. And, you know, now that we have a system that basically allows uh, these corporations to get away with it, because, I mean, who's going to hold these uh, uh, these CEOs of these pipelines accountable? Nobody. Not not the state, not the not the federal representatives, not the not the people in the Senate. And the people who are going to be paying for it in the long term are just going to be tax paying citizens. You know, and we were just talking about just really uh how much burden you know the people are going to deal with, and I only can also think about a lot of the Native American reservations that have once again uh, been screwed over by the U.S. government and its relationship with large uh, fossil fuel industry. Yeah, no, I could, you can see their history. 
hey, you can st- settle here. We'll have plenty of room. Okay, now we want that land. Go over there. Okay, now that you're over there, we want that land. So now go further away. Okay, you want that? Here's some blankets. Okay, now keep going this direction. Oh, we accidentally shot all your people. Okay, now, uh, well, we have this. We have this treaty. We're going to do this now. Uh, just uh, just take this pipeline. You know, um, I just it, w- It's oh. interesting how it's like, you know, you can look at on one side, you can say it goes slavery, um, Jim Crow segregation mass incarceration there's a similar um type of growth with native americans that we've done i mean it's just you know american a lot of ways you can say was built by slavery and on the back of genocide so yeah well i'm i mean it, it, look, look native american reservations there's reasons why they're there i mean the united states had a huge hostile policy uh towards you know the native american people uh and you know the the society's living there, and basically they were given only three choices: uh, you know, assimilate, uh, get off the land, or be exterminated. And, and I, and I saw I, some of the what, new what, history books, and they say that as, um, they say that as, oh, the Native Americans uh, were took this area, and the white settlers asked them first. So the Native Americans moved, so we're not even teaching it correctly in schools. So this is a huge issue. You have these inti- all these injustices that just keep happening, and no one bothers to teach it to the next generation so it can be stopped. Mm-hmm. And, you know, look, we're also looking at the fact that we have, um, you know, the, the, let's take, for example, the Keystone Pipeline. Now, this is a 200 and 687-mile system uh, that is going to be expanded on, and President Trump has basically issued a federal permit uh, for a project in March, and even though it's been it was rejected by the Obama administration, uh, this project will receive approvals in the states uh, between uh, Alberta, Canada, and Nebraska. And Nebraska uh, regulators plan to basically announce their decision on this expansion next week. And you know, pipelines and rely you know our reliance on fossil fuels it won't lead to anywhere. It's it, it's an archaic system that doesn't work. Daniel mentioned it before. We don't, uh, we don't need to use them. I mean, because because we got other countries that are adapting uh, green technology, and we are lacking, uh, you know, really investing into green technology and green energy. The only one of the only reasons we're really still using oil. I mean, if you take away the political aspect of it, is because we have an inf- the infrastructure is already built. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't need to be. The case. I mean, other stuff can be built, too. We've just forgotten how to build things. Remember, we used to build the highway system, the biggest earth-moving project in the world. Other countries have already overtaken that. China, I think, has now overtaken that system. China's building uh, a football field worth of solar panels, I think, every minute or every hour. So it's not something that's impossible. It's just we've invested in a dead end that we have an easy choice even now to completely switch from. You have solar's already cheaper to deploy than coal is, and then really you just have to deal with the batteries and the ability to store it or another uh, means to do the same thing. It's uh, I'm going to quote Elon Musk and, and how he described it. He said that um, if you just went to uh, the Nevada desert, built 100 square miles of solar panels, that's enough. These, and, a, and a square mile of battery packs, that's enough to power the entire U.S. It's not a lot. And you have a lot less people that will die from pollution, which if you actually look into it, if you look in China, it's even more so, is a much bigger number than you would expect. Um, Sickness-related illnesses from pollution are actually an enormous contributing factor to going back to healthcare. Why healthcare is so expensive? Because you're breathing in toxic particulates that we never evolved to breathe in. I mean, we're used to... You know, if you have some spores that you want to breathe in, our bodies are designed to handle that. That's not an issue. If you have soot for something that's underground that you don't ever come in contact with, that's an issue. That's something that our bodies haven't adapted to. So on that point, you already have solar that's cheaper. You just got to have – you combine that with wind, and you have a storage solution. You can redo everything. Now you say, okay, what do we do with plastics? Well, there's other materials you can use. You can – For example, grow hemp and do that and other materials so that, for example, the farmers that are growing all this ethanol, they don't need to grow ethanol. They have another cash crop to work with. Everything that we have 
has the economic ability to be replaced, it's not that big. I mean, I don't see why it's still big a fuss. But, and then, but then again, you factor in the political aspect of it, and you're like, oh right, that's why we're not able to do anything with energy. So, I mean, that's that's that's. I mean, it's a much bigger issue than just Apple. It's a much bigger issue than just these oil spills. It's an issue with the future being the present and the present being the past. Yeah, and, you know, our reliance on fossil fuels has led to uh, our government basically making deals with these large corporations at the expense of the American people. Now, look, the fact that this spill happened leads me to think a couple of things. Number one, uh, there's going to be more of them. There's, and There's always more well, of them. Well, yeah, yeah, there, of course. But, I mean, the thing is, we're, we're not really taking into account of the ones – that didn't happen or that haven't been reco- or, you know recorded because you mentioned before Daniel that you know the spills that have been recorded have been just done by the corporations themselves i mean w- what we need is real uh, data on all of the spills that happened because i could think back to a story a while back to where uh, it was i think in 2010 where there was just a you know a, a, you know a couple of kids in a truck driving around close by a pipeline they were you know decided to stop real quick relax and one of them lit up a cigarette and it blew up. It killed all four of those kids, and that truck blew up, man. And that, you know, that's just an example of just a leaky gas line right there. You know, how many other examples are there, like where there's a whole system failure? And the fact that we have this reliance on an archaic system shows our mindset of our of our government. And the fact that also we have people who are willing to go and bat for these pipelines, assuming that they're going to bring in jobs. That oil doesn't come back into our economy. The oil goes into the pocket of the rich CEOs and the uh, corporations itself, and the oil then goes to other countries. We don't get it. Our gas prices don't go lower. We're not benefiting from anything from the pipelines. The only thing that we are getting from the pipelines is uh, economic and environmental disasters. We're getting a, a lack of accountability from our government and our regulators. And all in all, the only people who are winning on top of the situation are um, – you know the the, the the corporate corporations well here's a bigger thing i would say just from a conceptual standpoint i still don't understand why you know i said again factor out the political aspects it becomes a question why are we digging for 300 million year old sunlight when we have fresh sunlight that hits us every day that well, is what it comes down it, to. It's, it's profits. That's the only reason why they're actually. And that's the thing. It. It's even. It's much cheaper to do it directly. It's cleaner to do it directly. Mm-hmm. It's again. It's if you as soon as you factor in politics, money, and politics, you're like, oh right, now it makes sense why we're not doing it. But if you pull it out, you pull the political power apparatus out of the picture. This does. This isn't. A, this is a nonsensical system that has replacements that could be readily utilized. Yeah, and our reliance on. Uh, the old system just goes to show you about the reach of money in politics. We've talked about this before in the past about money in politics and how it's crippling our democracy. Uh, when these large corporations buy a senator or a House representative, we have you know a lack of oversight, and they in turn basically uh, you know give these senators and House representatives the ability to uh, you know build as many projects as they want, and the senators and House representatives don't do anything towards them and. I, I, for one, feel that there needs to be a, a complete reform for uh, how everything is being done in our current system. I mean, Daniel, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I'm a monster broken record on this one. It's This is something that shouldn't be done this way, something that w- should be fixed, but it requires a multinational approach to move away from oil when people see, you know, countries will see on their balance sheets that, hey, I have these – uh, tar, uh, uh, these reserves I have underground that are worth trillions of dollars, so they see a few trillion dollars in assets that their comp- that their country has. They don't want to get rid of that. You have companies. You have a huge amount of the world assets that are defined into oil and fossil fuel production that would be lost. They don't want that. Again, this is you know it's an archaic system that just needs to be moved from. But. Yeah, and with that note, we are going to uh, move on to our special guest who will be joining Harlands Media, uh, Troy Lalavier. Uh, he uh, was on one of our live streams a while back uh, in August where he was uh, you know, doing a discussion on building a resistance 
uh, against you know racism and segregation here in our country, but he's also very well known as a Chicago principal as well as being a strong supporter of you know the Chicago Teachers Union and being a, you know an advocate for real political reform here in our city. And there's a lot of talk about a possible mayoral run, but we'll let the man speak for himself. Thank you so much for joining Harlan's Media. Can you at least let our listeners? <laughs> Uh, you know, understand who you are. Give us a little background of of of, of your uh, time here in the city. Um, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, my name is Troy Laravier. Um, I'm born and raised here in Chicago, uh, back of the yards, Bronzeville, Inglewood, Chatham, Washington Park. Uh, I've lived in Lakeview in my adult life in Beverly. Oh wow. Um. I attended Dunbar High School, mm -hmm. uh, graduated in 1987, joined the Navy, uh, came out, and um, got a job as a temporary secretary and was pretty happy doing it. And I had a girlfriend who was not happy with me doing it, so she forced me to attend college. I uh, got a degree in um, education after trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, became a teacher. Uh, and I became a teacher for one purpose, to help kids realize their potential because I almost didn't realize mine. If it wasn't for that girlfriend who sort of forced me to do what I didn't think I could do, um, who knows where I would have been. Uh, and so in the effort to get kids to realize their potential, you begin to realize there are obstacles outside of your classroom. You know, there are things as a teacher that you can't control, so you become a dean of students, and so you have a bigger effect. And then there are things as a dean of students that are not under your control. So you become an assistant principal and a principal. So you can have a larger effect. And it was really as a principal where um, I sort of became a, um, began to insert myself into the public dialogue because I had that same realization. There are things here that I don't affect. You know, I was a assistant principal at a school in North Lawndale, and the kids in North Lawndale were predominantly black, predominantly poor. I was also a principal in Lakeview, predominantly white, predominantly middle class, upper middle class. And my kids in Lawndale, North Lawndale, would come to school on day one of kindergarten, years behind the kids who came to school on day one of kindergarten in Lakeview. How's the school in Lawndale a failing school and the kids are behind on day one of kindergarten? Right? These kids have been failed long before they ever reached the school systems to buy things that principals and teachers have no part in. And the people who control those things are not being held accountable mm -hmm. <laughs> the way teachers and principals are being held accountable. Um, and so it was realizations like that and another realization in terms of things that were outside of my control were policies coming down from CPS and City Hall. One in particular was defunding schools. And at the same time they were defunding schools, they were spending hundreds of millions of dollars on privatization contracts. And so you're sitting in the school as a principal and you, your budget's just been cut $750,000, three quarters of a million dollars. And then you see Barbara Bird Bennett, your CEO appointed by the mayor, spend $20 million on a contract for principal training that you've been to and you know is horrible and everybody you've gone with are saying it's horrible, but no one's saying anything publicly because everyone's scared to lose their jobs. And it got to a point where I just said to myself, you know, I didn't get into this to keep a job. I got into this to live a purpose. And so I could not live that purpose and be silent. And so I began to speak and speak quite forcefully about the negative impact of this administration's policies on our schools. Um, and as a result of that, um, I eventually decided to support the Chuy Garcia campaign because I saw the mayor's office as the primary issue in terms of the policies of privatization and defunding schools that were coming out of that office and neglect of communities. You know, I could see the result of the neglect of communities coming to my school every day uh, throughout my career. And so I got behind Chuy Garcia. Um, 
the people who were behind that campaign also were the primary engine behind the Bernie Sanders campaign when it came to Illinois. And so they recruited me into that campaign, and I got heavily involved in the Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, was featured in a couple Bernie Sanders commercials, one that was focused here locally in Chicago and on the mayor and his failures. Uh, and eventually I was pulled from my school uh, in order to keep me from winning the office of president of the Chicago Principals and Administrators Association. Uh, despite that, I won with 70% of the vote, and that's the office that I hold right now. All right. And in regards to Ali City Hall and the Cook County, uh, what are your initial concerns in regards to their current policy towards public schools? Because it seems at the end of the day, um, there's money and resources for a police academy that's, what, $95 million? About, it, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have, like you mentioned, you have $20 million going to training. Right. That is inconsequential. And, and, and secondly, you have charter schools that in turn seem to have the first seat at the table, and at the same time, they only take the best and brightest students, leaving the rest of students behind. So uh, at least someone who's been in the system, you know, who's, who's seen the system firsthand and has been actively critical of it, what are your initial concerns towards how City Hall and Cook County are really dealing with uh, the crisis that's affecting our public schools? So when we look at City Hall, I don't know about Cook County as much, but yeah. when we look at City Hall and the governor, for that matter, but let's, fo let's, let's stay focused on City Hall. What we have to see are the people behind City Hall. City Hall is there. The people who are there were put there to represent certain interests. And those interests are those who come from the financial sector. Those are the interests. You know, I used to think when Rahm Emanuel was running for mayor, I mean, I was not a political person <laughs> when, in 2011 when he was running, right. 2010 and 2011. was not a political person. Um, and I remember them talking about all the money he was getting from California and from Hollywood and from all these different places. And, you know, me and my... Uh, non-political self, I'm looking at this and thinking, wow, these people must really like him. They're donating to him like this. Wow, he's got all these relationships. Wow. You know, just I'm drinking the Kool-Aid like half the other or 90% of the other folks in the city. Um, and what I did not understand at that point that I understand very clearly now is that those were not donations to his campaign. Those were investments. And when you make it an investment, the difference is, is, difference is that you expect a return on your investment. You invest in getting this person in because you know once he gets in, he will then be the Manchurian candidate who then gives you access to the resources that that office has. And what access does the mayor have? He has access to several billion of our tax dollars every single year. I mean, it, at least a hundred billion, more than a hundred billion dollars of our tax money has gone through his hands, is under his control in terms of over the course of the six years he's been in office. And so if you are a financier, if you are a banker, if you are looking for some sort of way to get rich quick, you're looking for some profit potential, the school system, for example, that's six billion dollars a year. But right now, that money's being, well, before Emmanuel, for the most part, that money was being spent on kids, being spent on staff. Yeah, that's your greatest expense in education, staff. And it should be your greatest expense because that's what education is. It's a service enterprise. In order to get taught, you need a teacher. And so if you're going to profit from that $6 billion, you have to create schemes and relationships that take that money away from what you're currently spending it on and then spend it on things that, one, you have to make the system seem like it's failing so that people have a motivation to stop spending it on what they currently spend it on and then convince the system to then spend it on you and your solution. And those solutions are privatized janitorial services. You mentioned charter schools. You mentioned vouchers. You, uh, I think the uh, the Aramark contract was $340 million. You're building new schools in a system that is not getting new students. That's an interesting one, by the way. You're taking out loans, and then instead of our future tax dollars going to pay for our kids' education, they're going to pay for interest on the loans that you took out. And 
lo and behold, all of the money that's now being spent on things other than our children are going toward the people who invested in the mayor in the first place. Like, this is all a scheme. It's all a, it's a grand design. Um, the Chicago Tribune in 2015, January, front page story. The title was Rahm Emanuel's Political Cash Machine. That was the front page of the Tribune. And in that story, it showed that 60 of his top 100 campaign contributors all got some kind of reward in the form of some city contract or appointment that siphoned hundreds of millions of dollars away from the services that are supposed to go toward the needs of the residents and toward the people who donated to the mayor's campaign. And so that's my initial um, answer to your question, that City Hall is there to represent in its current form, the interests of the people who funded the campaigns of the man who's sitting in the mayor's office. Now, uh, essentially, though, uh, this is going back to last month, especially on October 20th, uh, 26th, the Chicago Tribune printed out this article and which stated that the Chicago Board of Education on Wednesday approved a $5.7 billion budget that includes roughly $225 million in tax hikes and also authorized the sale of more than $1 billion in debt to help balance the budget and take on school uh, repair projects. Now, this relates to tax hikes and borrowing during the special education protest. Now, however, the Chicago Teachers Union and their supporters are critical of this and of Forrest Claypool's handling of this. So what will be the lasting impact of this budget and the effects it will have on special education in Chicago and the families of special needs students? So... I'll take this one by one because you mentioned a lot of stuff in there. You know, money for school repairs and construction. Again, you're building new schools in a district that isn't getting new students. That is insane. What company do you know of that will build a another, open another branch of itself across the street from itself to compete with itself for the same customer base? Even when Starbucks opens a one up across the street, it's usually because the one they have is not enough to compete with the high density of customers. But we don't have that issue in CPS. Right? We have fewer and fewer kids, and we're building more and more. Who does that? But when you look at the construction costs, lo and behold, it turns out that banks have a financial incentive to invest in, guess what, school construction. Because... Because of the federal, there's a federal incentive that allows them to double their profit if they invest in the construction of new schools. So they get behind a candidate such as our mayor. And what's one of his grand schemes for education? To continuously build new, unnecessary, unneeded schools. And lo and behold, I'm not shocked that, you know, after a, a Justice Department investigation where they clearly say that there is a need for training and the changing of culture uh, which requires personnel, which requires curriculum, which requires an investment in people who can train. He decides not to do that, but to do what? Build a $95 million um, police facility. Again, it's this building something new strategy. One, it helps his investors who put up the funds for the construction of the new facility. Uh, but two, it, it, it takes attention and resources away from the real need. Now, getting back to the special education part of your question, again, in order to spend money on these things, you have to stop spending it on the thing you're currently spending on. And special education has been targeted by this administration. At first, they were just targeting the general education program programs. Now they have begun to target special education and the way they did it last year was instead of normally when you give a budget what you do is you project. You'll have this many students so you'll get this many dollars. Last year they said no. What we're going to do is give you what you spent last year. Now you might say well what's wrong with that? What you spent last year is not based on what you have. is isn't always based on what you're going to get this year. 
You know, last year I might have got a kid in May, for example, in the last month of the school year. And I may have gotten some money for that kid at some point. That kid's going to be with me. I may have spent some money for that kid. That kid's going to be with me the whole year next year. But you're only going to give me what I spent on him last year, meaning you're only going to give me about a month worth of services for this kid. And I'm assuming that doesn't include inflation of any kind. None of any kind. Not only that, but then they froze 4%. And so what you really got was 96% of what you spent last year. And the, and the principals across the district is like, what is this? I don't, I can't get access to four percent of the funds. It's like a backdoor budget cut. You get to report to the press that we gave all of this money to schools, but in reality, the principals can't access tens, if not hundreds, of millions of those dollars because they're in the budget in name only. You can't actually touch it. It's a digit on the screen, but there's no real money behind that you can actually touch. And therefore, what you've done is a 4% across-the-board cut in special education. And then what happens? They tell principals, uh, well, if you don't have enough, you can fund it out of your general education dollars. Now, what's the problem with that? You, principals don't have extra general education dollars lying around. Those dollars are invested in what? Positions, teachers, assistant principals, counselors, tutors. So th- what they're really saying is, If you need this special education kid to get this classroom assistant, you're going to have to cut your assistant principal or cut a teacher or cut a librarian, right? And so they're putting principals in the position of having to, using the underfunding of special ed to give principals a reason to understaff general ed. And so the special ed kid, to get back to your question, loses out no matter what decision the principal makes. Because if he decides, I can't do without my assistant principal or I can't do without one of these first grade teachers because that would put class size up to 40 in a class and I can't do that. So I can't do it. Then the kid loses his aid. But if he decides I'm going to cut one of these first grade teachers and that's going to send classroom sizes up to 35 to 40 and I'm going to give this kid, I'm going to take that money and I'll give this kid his classroom assistant, that kid, where do special education kids spend the most, the majority of their time? In general education classrooms. So now that kid has his aid, but he's going to spend the majority of his day in an overcrowded classroom. That special education child loses out no matter what decision the principals make in an environment where the main drive is to underfund either special ed or general ed. It touches them either way. Does that answer your question? That does. I I want to say it also sounds like a divide and conquer strategy. Now you have teachers, and I would assume the teachers' union is now to some degree, uh, at least on tense terms, if not fighting the special education system because they're seeing it as a threat because of the way the funding model is put together. No, uh, because, I mean, they're special education sisters. I mean, they're special education teachers. Right. right? The special education teachers are part of the union. Unless I heard, did I hear your question right? I'm more more saying that it sounds like if if Emmanuel's putting it in a position where, hey, special education, if you want special education to work, you got to take away from the general fund that it seems like it would cause it would be a by uh, a consequence of it would be that you cause a rift between the two groups because then they're fighting for the same pool of money. So, so that hasn't necessarily happened. And, and divide and conquer has happened, but not necessarily among. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. The the teachers, you know, the special education teachers are part of CTU. Right. The general education teachers are part of CTU. Right. Uh, CTU in general is fighting the changes in this system. What One of the things that it's done, though, however, is created a divide-and-conquer mentality among parents. Oh, okay. So if I'm a parent, right, if I insist that my kid gets his or her service and the principal of the school ends up overcrowding this other parent's kid's oh, classroom as right. a result of it, it puts parents in this, this very divisive uh, your kid versus my kid position. That's how I have seen the divide and conquer mentality manifest itself. Now, has there been any kind of uh, outreach, at least from the CTU, towards uh, parents of general students and special needs students to really let them understand the situation that's happening in City Hall, as well as Mayor Emanuel's policies towards, uh, you know, the the resources for Chicago public school students as a whole? I mean, has there been any kind of like real big sit down or forum to really explain just the the crisis that we're, we're dealing here with? 
Yeah, I would never put myself in a position to speak for CTU. Right. Uh, I can say I've seen evidence that they're doing this to the extent uh, that it's happening behind the scenes. I, I, I think you'd, you'd have to call Jesse mm -hmm. or one of the CTU folks, and I'm sure they'd give you a, an upfront answer. But I've certainly seen them on the scene uh, of this special education fight. That I can say for certain. What has been your experience with the, the TIF accounts that Emmanuel has been using? Well, it's interesting. Um, there, a TIF event <laughs> is, and I didn't even know that was the event, um, was how I made my f very first public statement um, at City Hall. Um, my They had cut our budget, um, three quarters of a million dollars, and I decided I was going to speak out and say something. Um, and I was at an event. Uh, my parents had organized, the parents of Blaine had organized a citywide local school council coalition um, as a result of the budget I presented to them. I told them, you know, you, you can't, we can't fix this as Blaine. They're not going to hand Blaine $100,000. But if you reach out to LSEs across the district and you guys fight together for them to infuse more money into the district than Blanton can be. Blaine can be one of the beneficiaries of that. And so in 2013, they organized this citywide coalition. Uh, and as a result of that coalition, um, CPS released $10 million more million into the system. Blaine got about 100000 of that. And... The, it was interesting. This is a side point. We'll get. I'm still on my way to answering your question. The side point is that, you know, I was to wonder. I, I can't. It was an interesting situation with me coming to Blaine because it's a predominantly uh, white, wealthy community. I spent most of my career in predominantly black, poor communities, and I remember feeling like I needed to go there for a reason, but not quite sure why. But knowing there's a reason, and after that coalition forced CPS to release that $10 million. I found out that the community that got the most, the highest percentage of that money was North Lawndale, mm -hmm. the community I had just come from. Right? And so as principal of Blaine, I was able to influence um, the development of a movement that helped the community I had come from much more than I could have ever helped it if I had stayed there, right? That was just an interesting side note, but getting back to your question, as a part of those activities uh, to push C City Hall and CPS, when you, when you talk CPS, you're really talking City Hall. They make the decision. So to push City Hall to put more money into the schools, there was a um, press conference. And my parent, I had a parent at my school who was the head of the coalition that they built, um, and she was going to speak at it, and she told me... Um, you know, that she was going to speak. And I said, you know, I think they need to hear a principal. Principals aren't saying anything. They need to hear a principal. And so the guy who organized the thing um, put me on the speaking roster, and it turned out to be a press conference organized against the $55 million TIF huh. um, for what was then thought to be the stadium, but then came to be a hotel, and then later we found out it was about a Ferris wheel. All right? But the first time I came out to speak was at a press conference against that particular tip. And the idea was that you're spending $55 million of money that comes from a fund that siphons money off from a fund that is supposed to fund parks and public schools. And you just cut school budgets across the district by millions and millions of dollars, and now you're giving $55 million at that time, we thought, to build a stadium. This makes absolutely no sense. And so that was my first encounter um, with TIFs. I've seen them misused again and again in terms of building luxury residences. I mean, you name it. Yeah. Um, they're abused. I'm not the one. I'm not one of those folks that says the TIFs should be ended. You know, I just think... You can, you can spend any kind of revenue corruptly. You can mismanage it, and you can spend it recklessly. Right. Um, and it is my belief that we just need to make sure the money gets spent the way it's supposed to be spent. And it certainly is not to build stadiums, Ferris wheels, or luxury private residences. And that's a good note to end it on. We're going to have to 
end this episode of Hardlands Media. But uh, real quick, can you at least let our listeners know uh, where they can find you on social media? And uh, we'll just end it at that. Oh, God, that was so short. Um, <laughs> you know, I could go on forever. I'm at uh, Troy. My, my name is how you get in contact with me. Everything is my name. And so uh, T-R-O-Y-L-A-R-A-V-I-E-R-E. So for Twitter, it's at Troy LaRavier. On Facebook, you just look up Troy LaRavier. The email is TroyLaRavier at gmail.com. So all that's right. how you get in touch with me. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining Hard Lens Media. To all our listeners, uh, please follow us on social media. And if you like and support independent media, we have a Patreon account. Your support allows us to build more content and do more interviews. Thank you to everyone. And let's all do what we can to build a better future. Peace, everyone. <laughs>